Good evening. Um, we will start now a series of talks about uh, uh, independent pollution in Cuba. Uh, we are um, talking here with uh, Pablo de Cuba Soria, he's um, the director of uh, Casa Vacía, Editorial Casa Vacía. He's in the U.S. Waldo Perezino is the uh, director of Bucket Editorial and Almenara Press. <clears throat> he's in Liden, um, Netherlands. We have here with us um, Ladislao Aguado, who is the director of Hypermedia, and um, Carlos Aníbal Alonso, who is the um, director of um, Rialta Press and also Rialta Magazine. Um, this talk will continue in Spanish. So if you want to um, follow this conversation with some kind of subtitles in English, you can go to Facebook, Insta, Institute, the, uh, Instituto of uh, Activism, Anna, and they will have their, uh, they will be, you know, um, broadcasting the, the talk with subtitles or, or um, uh, simultaneous uh, translation. <clears throat> so, well, from now on, we will continue talking in Spanish. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here, if you understand. Of, Otherwise, I, you know, sorry for that problem. <clears throat> bueno, eh, bienvenido, eh, Waldo, well, eh, Pablo, welcome, eh, Waldo, y Pablo, a y a and Aníbal. here with us, Ladislao <laughs> and Carlos Aníbal. This is the first in a series of talks that we will hold this week here in Kassel and the title is Autonomous Publishers from Clandestine Distribution to Independent Publishing. I want to start with you two over on the screen. Could you tell us how and when your publishing houses emerged? Maybe Pablo, if you could start by telling us about Casa Vacío, what prompted you to create it and when? 
what challenges you confronted and then uh, based on that we can uh, discuss it with the others No se escucha. No, no se escucha nada. We can't hear you, Pablo. No. ¿Eh? Maybe you should unmute your microphone, Pablo. Okay, maybe we could uh, move on to Waldo and see because you might have to connect again. Let's let's try Waldo. Can you hear me? It seems that uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Hi, Joaquin, Aníbal, Ladislao, Pablo. Could you try now, Pablo? We cannot hear you two. Yes. We do hear you, Waldo. Okay. What about Pablo? No, we can't hear Pablo yet. Okay, then I will start. Thank you for your invitation, Joaquin. You were asking me about the origins of Bokeh and Almenara. In their current form, they started out in uh, late 2014 in the Netherlands. Boke existed previously in Amberes in 2012. We published a couple of books at the time, but the design and the concept was different. So they don't really count. So the they were both founded in 2014 and from the onset, they were founded uh, with the idea that they would be two different series, not only in terms of their graphic identity and their content, but they will also addressing different audiences. Almenara is an academic press. Basically, we publish Latin American studies and cultural critique with a critical apparatus and following academic criteria and style. Not so with bokeh, it's rather the opposite in as much in the sense that it's uh, it's uh, much more free 
so we are less constrained when we decide what we publish and how. Of course, we publish lit literature, poetry. We have published a few essays and some drama. So these two different lines were conceived as such from the start. And in fact, this is what allows us to function to some extent, meaning Almenara allows us to, allows Boke to exist and vice versa in terms of uh, financial sustainability, etc. So that's more or less the, the story in broad strokes. Pablo, would you mind trying? Can you hear me now? Yes, okay, perfect. So then maybe tell us about the beginning of Casa Vacía. I want to send an affectionate embrace to you all. The audio is clipping, so it's difficult to follow. The audio is clipping, Pablo, so... Early on, at the beginning, Casa Vacía So we have published some academic uh, works, but for the most part, we publish literature in a broad sense. Instead of this distinction between Almenara and Bokeh, where academic and literature are separate, what I have created is different series under the same label. So I have a collection that is academic, where I, I have published a few titles, and then I have another collection where we publish literature, translations. And a broader collection for a wider compass of literature written in Spanish. I basically go at my own pace. Mm -hmm. 
We will continue then with Rialta. Carlos Aníbal, tell us how Rialta emerged. I know that before that you directed the UH uh, Publishing House. Yes, at uh, Havana University, I was running, I was a director of their academic journal publications branch. I would like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation and discussing these issues. It's really important to do so in the context of a show like Documenta. Rialta also arose out of a personal story. I think it's the same for all of us, right? It comes from your life. Before that, it has to do with the fact that there is an utter lack of imagination everywhere in Cuba. It's no longer just a, a matter of material lack. It's also the fact that as an intellectual, as a scholar and as a reader, I uh, you feel that you need to work on the margin of the state's criteria and their exclusions. So you also, you create a publishing house to affirm yourself from a critical point of view, to propose a critical reading of the tradition. And so I think that all of our publishing houses came up around the same time. I left Cuba in January 2015 and I migrated to Mexico to do a master's program. So suddenly I had some funds and free time and the possibility, which I wasn't aware of in Cuba, of having the option of creating a company and creating my own projects. So I said to myself, well, I've spent my whole life enduring uh, forms of working that I did not think were appropriate, then I will take this chance. Still, I insist that Rialta is not my project. It's the project of a collective, a group of friends who contribute ideas. And we decided uh, for the, principally to affirm our, our sense of literature. Rialta has grown. But at the time of its found, foundation was a, first and foremost a literature project. We were interested in literature because as Ibrahim has said, he's another of Rialta's uh, founders. Uh, the, the aesthetic realm was one of the last areas in Cuba where we had some freedom. After being deprived of any so many possibilities, we could still use literature as a space of encounter. I think that this is why during those years, many different publishers and independent media popped up and they have contributed to the placation of Cuba's public sphere. I would like to see how at some point also artists and writers in Cuba, well, for many years, they were actually taking the place of the press. They were reporting on reality because there was not a plural press, an efficient press. We didn't have the ecosystem of independent media that we now have. So art and literature took over that role for the press. And uh, in a way, we asked ourselves, what? how do we position ourselves with respect to our country's reality? Uh, this is also something that you decide within a publishing project. Hello, good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank Tania, Instar, and you, Joaquin, for the possibility of presenting hypermedia here today. This is a really a necessary space for us so we can share our work and our notions, our understanding of uh, the publishing world and the independent press. Hypermedia origins are very similar, similar to those of the other independent publishers. At some point, we realized that there was a void, that the 
publishing houses in the Spanish language ecosystem was uh, lacking Cuban authors because uh, in a way, uh, especially the authors of the country found it very difficult to have access to the big publishers in Spanish. So Hypermedia uh, began to publish. First books were especially essay and literature, or literary essays. Uh, Batista, when his publishing house Colibri closed up, he ceded us the rights to some of his uh, materials and we started to publish some of their authors first digitally and then much like Casa Vacia, we also created an academic series Hypermedia Ideas, which focuses on sociocultural studies. And we also continue to publish literature alongside publishing Hypermedia Magazine and Hypermedia Review, which is our printed journal. Those are our four main lines of work. We've tried to build a space for Cuban authors who were prevented from access to the circuit of the language. We have published a collection of writings by authors who migrated in the Mariel, the works of authors who have been banned in Cuba or whose books did not reach Cuban readers. To illustrate the, our first stage, there's an anecdote. I once received an email that just said, you are being studied now. I was being sent a link um, to a master's thesis being written in Cuba about the damage that hypermedia was doing to Cuban culture by publishing. So this was a, a person who was uh, writing a master's thesis about uh, the wrong that hypermedia was doing by publishing books that Cuban readers were not prepared to read for the Caribbean Social Sciences Journal. So that led me to think that we were on the right track. It's uh, funny because uh, in the case of Pablo and Waldo, you are sort of pure publishers, so to speak, whereas Carlos, Carlos Aníbal and Ladislao, in their case, it's very difficult to separate the work of their publishing houses with the work that they do in online platforms. I would like to discuss this uh, unique uh, a fact. A publishing house, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, advertises uh, publications. But in your case, I would like to know how do you choose a profile? I mean, as a reader, I could even get a sense that each of your publishing houses has uh, achieved a very singular profile, but in the big world of uh, publishing world and literary, literary world in Cuba, it's difficult to tell. The Cuban readers are, in a sense, promiscuous. They like to be in all the parties, let's say. Uh, they don't want to just publish for Casa Vacia, they want to publish in all publishers. I don't know if this is a problem. I mean, I'm calling it a problem just to use to, to use a word. It, we don't need to understand it as a problem. Feel, I would say that there's a, they feel the need. A writer so wants to be present in all different media. Uh, maybe because uh, they were enclosed for so many years and had access to facilities. But so maybe the, we could discuss it in these terms. In the case of you too, especially because your publishers, but also in a sense, media platforms, how do you determine your specific profile? I mean, when we see your books, we can immediately tell 
that they come from your publishing house and that they take demonstrate a certain attitude well in in the case of bouquet almenara well we maybe we do have some interests but mainly our criterion is about academic rigor you know the what we publish needs to stand up on its own right as an essay or as an academic work in in bouquet then uh, we do have to deal with taste and about creating conversations on the basis of our taste i i don't necessarily love the work of uh, every author published in bokeh but their work always resonates with that of others published by bokeh so often uh, we're looking for a kind of order as you would find in a library and you don't just follow enthusiasm or a zero to ten scale you also you're looking to create internal dialogues and internal connections between the authors that you are publishing or i mean between their texts because uh, Something distinctive of bokeh is that we have always been interested in texts as sources of meaning rather than the visibility, which is usually ephemeral, the media visibility of an author as a figure, as a media figure. I don't know if this is an answer to your question or if this raises further questions, but I will leave it at that. Pablo, do you have something to add? In the case of uh, Waldo said something that was very interesting. He talked about how you organize a library and the editorial exercise as in analogy to organizing your, your library. And I think that this is a, a good such way um, to talk to Pablo because he's a collector and he's a bibliophile. Do you think, do you resonate with this idea that you're in a way trying to create a perfect uh, library uh, through your editorial work? We, we should continue because it seems like Pablo needs to reconnect. I think it's very subversive to understand publishing as a novelistic work. Each book is the chapter of a novel that you're assembling. And in a sense, that is what editorial work is. But at least in my own experience, in the case of Rialta, you early on bang your head up against reality. I mean, there many you would like to publish many books that you can't publish for several reasons then there are books that you have to publish for practical reasons to establish a working relationship with uh, other institutions for instance and especially because at some point you have a responsibility to stay afloat so, to some extent, the publishing house is not just the sum of the books, but it also includes the books that you choose not to publish, the books that you leave out. It's not only what you affirm, but also what you avoid or omit. On the other hand, look, there are books that even symbolically mean a lot, not just to me as an editor or as a reader, but as a Cuban. Rialta, legally speaking, is, is a Mexican publishing house, and we are part of an organization that is also 
cited in Mexico, and they are Mexican books. So when we published Los Años de Orígenes, this was reviewed as the first Cuban edition of that book. So you have a group of Cuban people living in Mexico, but although some people who work with us do not actually live in Mexico, they live in the United States or in Spain. So how come that this is uh, regarded as a Cuban book? I think that this is a very suggestive idea, Waldo's notion. I, I share it to, in many regards, but I couldn't really understand our catalog as this kind of curatorial endeavor where they are all links in a chain that is carefully assembled. Well, Hypermedia's catalog, let's say that uh, what Waldo says is what every editor would hope for, that there would be coexistence among the books you publish and that they relate through your affect and interest as a reader, not just as an editor, for the books. You're creating a cosmos a library that functions on its own, and that is our aspiration. You try it, and sometimes you achieve that, and sometimes you don't, don't but then you do have a practical concerns, as Carlos Aníbal mentioned. Sometimes you have to publish a certain title knowing that you are, in a sense, upsetting the cosmos of this library. But the same thing happens in all libraries. There are always books that are, in a sense, intruders. Some books that you have there, and if somebody came to check, they would realize that they don't fit in the order of your library. And these are the books that you publish because you have some needs to fulfill and you have to take certain decisions. In your case, Pablo, let's see if maybe we can hear you now. I was saying that in your case, I felt that there was a lot of resonance with what Waldo said because you are a bibliophile. I always see that when you travel, you're going to the flea markets and antiquarians and looking for first editions and all of that. So I would like to ask how you how do you define your profile as an editor and how you assemble this library, so to speak? Hopefully, we can hear you. Can you hear me okay? I would say that a library establishes a set of pillars that over time, Pablo, I think that your headphones are causing a delay because maybe they are wireless headphones. Yeah, we do hear you. What I was saying is that a library over time is a it's an assemblage of expressions and modulations of myself of course there are certain pillars that remain over time and then some pillars replace other pillars which disappear i would say that casa vacia is to some extent an expression of my obsession uh, as a book collector my obsession with putting together a library so as waldo said some of the authors we publish are not necessarily in sync with my understanding of writing. And of course, my sense of writing in the last 10 years may have shifted, although some 
It holds by certain concepts and ideas, but it may have shifted. So in a sense, Casa Vacia understood as a library is also a struggle with my own angels and demons. So I agree that you have to be flexible and open yourself up to other forms of expression. They would never, of course, they would never, they would never be going in the opposite direction to my understanding of literature and editing. But I do understand the library as a, as a set of movements, as something dynamic, and publishing houses in a way function in the same way. There are some supports that remain steadfast and others shift and are replaced. And I have also, in a sense, had to expand my range within my understanding of literature. Sometime earlier, you were saying that Rialta and Hypermedia, for example, are also connected to digital platforms. Casa Vacia, of course, we have a website, but we, we don't have a clear media uh, digital platform pl platform because Casa Vacia is more of a personal project with support from a few friends. So maybe this is why it's been harder for us because uh, it would take more people to maintain an online platform. I think that one of the main challenges for independent publishers, especially successful ones, those that have the greater reach are those that uh, are located outside of Cuba. And so the situation is odd because their readers are in an island that and have no access to these books. So sometimes you have to bring in your publications in a clandestine way and you cannot use established distribution lines to reach your ideal reader in a sense. And uh, I would also like to ask you when you respond to this question to uh, address the idea or the question, how is it possible for this dynamic between the author and the publisher? How can this uh, dynamic um, emerge in spaces that are not necessarily the book as such? Some people are distributing material using USB drives and other kinds of format. And maybe this blows up our understanding of the publishing project. Our readers are kidnapped in a sense, and we need to reach them one way or another. I also have noticed that most independent publishers have 90% uh, of their authors are Cuban. This investment, is this a... Why is this? Why is this? Is this a decision? Is this a whim? Is this an emotional connection? We know that this is a market that independent publishers need to create, right? In the, if it were ideally, you would have a distribution chain in Cuba to reach your readers, but sometimes you have to go through informal distribution routes or to publish your books in countries where readers are not really necessarily prepared to understand what you publish. Maybe we could start again with uh, our online guests. Well, I will continue with what I was saying. You, you raised many questions at the same time, so maybe my answer will be equally complex. 
Well, let's let's do it in parts. I think that any independent project, a publishing project or any other kind of project, if it is independent, in addition to this independence, which is it's often nominal because there are links to institutions, but it is defined by an ethics, a connection between enthusiasm, the desire to create a niche and sustainability. If an independent project, I mean, if you want to organize a happening at a given date, this does not need to endure over time, but a publishing house does need to endure over time, at least a reasonable amount of time. A publishing house that lasts for six months would make no sense. You cannot assemble a catalog in six months. You could not create this meaningfulness that is proper to a library, as we were saying before. So, so you also encounter cycles uh, peaks in enthusiasm and then valleys. Why do I mention this? Because it connects with something that you just mentioned, the idea that there is an expected audience or a proper audience, which it is difficult to reach. And of uh, publishing in places where your readers are not available. I mean, I would say that we have to note that overall we are confronting a crisis in reading. I mean, in the Western countries, people read much less or they read otherwise. They read short articles, they read on the internet. So people are just not reading books as they did 30 years ago. So this natural readership that you say would be in Cuba, I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if this natural readership exists anywhere. I often feel that much of my editorial work or the one that is being done by Rialta and Casa Vacia and Hypermedia and Bokeh, I think that it's almost an archival kind of work. It's not uh, so much about immediate, direct uh, circulation of uh, certain titles. It's my feeling. I'm not trying to say that it's exactly so, but uh, I have many questions about this. You've captured it very well because I think maybe this is not how people would phrase it. That is the reality. Unconsciously, what you're producing is a kind of archive, an emotional, cultural archive. Right, technically, if we abide by the concept of what a publishing house in the real world, so to speak, we are not publishers. We function as collectors, but in truth, we are not publishing houses. We are an incubator. We are an archive. Exactly so, because a publishing house is a company that includes distribution methods, reader management, presentations in book libraries, through corporate analysis uh, of uh, where you go start with the idea that there is a demand that you need to satisfy but if you were in the in a con but to be a publishing house you would have to be located in cuba so we are two european publishing houses and one in mexican and one in the United States. So we need to, for example, in terms of taxes, we need to go by the laws of the countries where we are located. So technically this discredits us as Cuban publishers. Now, if you look at our affections and our authors, we are Cuban publishers, but it could perfectly be a Spanish publishing house that devotes itself to the publication of Cuban authors. So even if 90% of your catalog is, Cube, is by Cuban writers, it does not mean that you are a Cuban uh, publisher. 
that we ourselves are Cuban, our authors are Cuban, well, still we are not Cuban publishers. If you look at uh, where we pay taxes, but since we deprive ourselves of functioning as a company in relation to our natural readers, wherever they might be, we are technically disqualified to be regarded as a publishing company. And this means that we are a different kind of entity. Mostly all of us have nonprofit organizations. And this means that we are following an altruistic stance we want to preserve the work of certain authors we want to publish their works adequately and find very limited ways to market these books and often most of the work that we do is uh, simply directed at the future with an expectation you could not really do a market analysis of how we would be working if we were proper companies this is maybe a complex thing to say, but this is our authors don't even realize that they are not just dealing with a publishing house, that they are dealing with a, an editorial intention that actually functions rather as an archive. Well, I want to follow up on your idea, Joaquin. In many regards, you're working also for a future reader. I don't know how it is for the others, but Rialta cannot sustain itself as an organization through the selling of copies. This allows us some support, but it would not sustain our project. So it's rather similar to artistic work, something that you do to affirm yourself and to fulfill a social responsibility. One hand. On the other, Waldo was uh, being very critical of this idea that Cuban readers living in the island are our ideal readers. Because at some point you start to understand that Cuba is not simply a geographical term. Okay, we well, cannot send your book, your printed book to Cuba, but there are, and websites are also blocked and digital platforms are also blocked. But then you say in one form or another, we are communicating with Cuba's everyday reality and we are having a decisive impact on how on cultural policy in Cuba in many respects. So then you might, okay, then we are present there somehow. I don't know how. I come across readers, part of our editorial team does in Cuba. They've worked on the book, but never seen the book, the printed book. But then some of them might uh, say to me, hey, I went to my friend's house and I, and I finally got to see the book there. So you visit someone's house and you find this book that you worked on, but you had never seen in the flesh. But so this idea of your readership also changes. It's not just uh, about the Cuban as an end in itself. This, in a sense, is maybe a provincial viewpoint and it impoverishes the project. Yes, our authors are Cuban. We are discussing Cuba, and I would love for the books to be in Cuba. But we should not think that uh, our readers are only people living in the island. We would love to have a, contra a distribution contract to sell the books in the island. But I mean, in the island, you don't even have food. So imagine selling books. So this idea of what is Cuba is becoming more complex and diverse. And now you are dealing with a space that is not just geographical. Maybe we are not a post nation, but maybe Cuba is a post geographical notion. I don't know if the word really works, but I am very interested in the idea. I mean, you were saying 
You were talking, describing a kind of transnational situation because ultimately, right, I said that our readers are kidnapped in the island, but there are also 3 million Cubans living abroad. So it's maybe also a transnational and multi geographical space. So Cuban readers maybe are scattered all over the world. And this also creates different possibilities for your publishing houses. Then again, I think that independent publishers as a whole, there are four of you here, but the Cuban independent publishing ecosystem is very large, it's extensive. There are many in Florida since the 1960s, there are many publishers we see some publications by some of, but those of you who are here, I think are unique and allow us to understand this wide ecosystem. Also in Spanish, in Spain, and maybe this uh, makes it possible for a great amount of cultural production, but it's a Cuban in a cosmopolitan sense because maybe there are people who have been in exile and understand literature in a very different way and they publish their work in independent publishers. I don't think that Cuba's state publishers uh, publish more than independent publishers abroad, including yours. In Pablo's case, it's a very capricious and personal endeavor, but he has an incredible catalog with a very select group of authors. And the, the rest of you publish, I am sure, more than any provincial publishing house in Cuba. So I think that this opens up the debate. Maybe we should uh, uh, challenge the idea that being located in Cuba is what allows you to be called a Cuban publisher. Of course, uh, tax and laws this is this set some some uh, geographical determinations but not so much in terms of uh, reach pablo maybe you could share your thoughts on this can you hear me good i think that waldo's archive idea is very exact if we think in two of the largest bibliographical archives, let's say the British Library and the Library of Congress, well, these are enormous archival institutions, but they are maintained by state and private funds. Even these enormous institutions would not be able to sustain themselves. Casa Vacía, if it were supposed to function as a company, would have failed after six months. If we run the numbers, probably, at least in my case, we would not be able to maintain ourselves through our publishing enterprise. So I think that, of course, the idea of the archive means that there is a will behind the project that is not simply about financial rewards. So I think to describe it as an archive is very accurate for that reason. On the other hand, well, Cuba, understood as the natural space for Casa Vacía, well, if I follow the statistics, I would say yes, that I am contacted by 70-80% of Cuban authors. But on the other hand, the other 20-30% of non-Cuban authors whom I publish, in a way, creates a wider spectrum beyond Cuba. And ultimately, what could be called Cuban nowadays if it is not this kind of transterritorial culture? 
that is becoming more and more complex. And I would say that even Cuban readers nowadays, they live where it's difficult for them to do so, but they are living on the internet uh, in a space that is not just geographical. I am often surprised there are authors in Cuba who will say, I, I read a book, a Casa Vacia house at so-and-so's house. It's interesting because I can rarely send books directly to Cuba, but one way or another, they get in. So this shows that geographical boundaries are now much more complex because even people inside Cuba spend their experiences as readers are mediated by the internet and networks for better or worse. But this uh, brings them out of the geographical space that we are calling natural. So I think that to some extent our publishing projects find expression in these virtual and network spaces. On the other hand, if I try to think about which of our titles has had the most repercussion, it's Capablanca's biography. But well, who's Capablanca? He's the least Cuban of Cubans because he carries a universal significance. It's not just significant within Cuban culture. So it's a Cuban individual who breaks the boundary of what is quote unquote naturally Cuban. So I think that in a sense, Capablanca's biography, I'm being hyperbolic, but it's, a, it's an example of what uh, this idea. I mean, as we all know, anywhere in the world, publishing books is bad business, right? There are other uncertainties, but nobody makes money printing books, publishing books. Big publishers, what often, what they do often is that they uh, combine their business model in such a way that they do publish, but the earnings, the revenue does not come directly from selling copies. We can examine this in individual cases of Latin American publishing houses that are not a good business, but they survive. For example, Sexto Piso, well, they had to create their own distribution company. And then you realize that at the end of the day, profit comes from distribution. So if you have a bad business and you add the Cuban curse, because uh, everything in Cuba is illegal except for what is obligatory, then you get a sense of uh, how we go about our work. To speak on technical terms, there is a problem that Pablo mentioned and that impacts all of us. As I was saying, geography is about taxes, but also about institutions. As you mentioned, publishing houses in most countries have assistance, for example, when libraries purchase their titles, universities, museums, private institutions. So, okay, it's not a business that you will get rich, but if it's uh, said that the Capablanca biography should be, there should be a copy in each school and university in Cuba, then how many, school, how many schools are there? Okay, this would mean that the publisher can count on the minimum amount of copies being sold. And this would mean that you could count on being even when you publish a title and not going into loss. 
So if you have public and private institutions that are contributing to the construction of an archive, this means that you will be able to have income through other ways, and this would allow you to stay afloat. Because if you start accumulating debt, you will have to close shop. And we also don't have access to bank credit, I cannot go to a bank and say, well, I am a company and I need a stimulus of $100,000 to publish these books and sell them in the Cuban market. You know, they will tell me, come back tomorrow with a profitable project. So we also lack access to credit and often small and medium-sized companies would have access to such credit in their own geographical basis. Of course, I see that there is an absence of institutions. This is a problem for exiled culture. There are no institutions to protect you or to invest in what you're doing. They are basically private institutions, and this private money, as we know, first of all, could never reach the level of a public funding or a public effort to sustain a part of culture. But, I mean, since we're talking about the challenges confronted by independent publishers and their extreme vulnerability, you're working out of uh, love, and this means that sometimes you also confront a misunderstanding from the readers who might mistakenly think that the publishing houses are making a profit and it is not so at all. It's a labor of love. I know that I know that sometimes, for example, writers are expecting that they will make more money out of uh, the publication of the book and they may think that the publishing house is uh, not paying them what they are due. So maybe there are perceptions that people who are not aware of how it works, they have a misperception. Some of you might be regarded as very successful but business people because you're producing well-made, beautiful books and people think, well, they must be making a profit. They might, writers might think that, oh, these people are building an empire on our account. So what are the actual risks and challenges and conflicts confronted by independent publishers in, for example, these relationships with authors and potential misunderstandings? Maybe we could start again with Waldo. Well, all kinds of things happen. In Almenara, there is a perfect example. We occasionally publish collective volumes. Let's say literature in the Dominican Republic, etc. A collective academic volume with the essays by different authors. What does this exemplify? The differences between authors, the differences between texts, the problems with each text and communication with each author, it's, you would be surprised. It's fascinating and sometimes it's exhausting. For example, with the poets and authors of literature, I sometimes feel that they need to make a book graphically, physically. You might have some come into conflict there. Uh, they might disagree with your, the editor's design for how the book should look. And you might get into a fight about that with the poet, for example. So there's all kinds of things might happen.
Would you like to continue, Pablo? Yeah, can you hear me well? My experience as an editor with authors, I would say the same. It can be very different. It can be very aggressive and very docile, and it covers the whole spectrum. It's a confrontation with others. There are some authors who maybe are a bit full of themselves, and then there are people who are really willing to work in a harmonious manner, undoubtedly. You let's we've also also talked about sustainability and we can return to this now because I would like to emphasize that I mean if if we think at visible publishers, let's say in the in Spain, for example, Anagrama Acantilado. Uh, an average of 10% of what they publish are the battle horses. So, you know, 10% of the titles they publish are the source of revenue, and this allows them to publish all the others. They need to do this to create a catalog, but even so, the only publishing houses that are really profitable, that really cr generate a profit, are educational publishing houses in the United States, McGraw-Hill, their income is based on publishing educational textbooks. When it comes to literature, I mean fiction or nonfiction, this isn't even a 5% of their capital. Their capital is devoted to this niche, which creates the actual profit. So from the start, a publishing house that is devoted to literature is condemned to fail. Sure, there are exceptions. I mean failure in the sense of unprofitability. There are exceptions, of course, but they actually confirm the pattern or the rule. So to return to the idea of the archive, I think that Waldo's proposal is excellent. And so what happens, I have often come across authors who have a preconceived understanding of how authors' rights work and of the kind of profit that a book can generate. Sometimes they have a wild notion. Sometimes they can argue for it, but even so, the fact is that the project isn't, isn't really about generating profit. So when authors, I don't even mean the authors who think that they are uh, going to get rich by publishing a book, but It is uh, the least likely that an author will make a profit. And if an author were to make a profit, it would allow, it would be a 1% that allows for the other 99% of the publisher's catalog. If there isn't an author that in a way drags the others you could not have the catalog. So publishing houses start to make a name for themselves and become sustainable through time by expanding their catalog. And of course, ideally being very rigorous. What is your experience, Carlos Aníbal? <laughs> 
a los editores hablar más de los de nuestros autores. Well, it's strange that you're asking us the publishers to to speak ill of our authors. I would like to say that Rialta has a, is we have extremely good relations with all our authors and we've never had such problems. But of course, profit is certainly complicated. How can we generate income without relying on sales? Well, there are other strategies. Even within the publishing house, Rialta is, as an organization goes beyond the publishing house. So we have had to, for example, work in association with the university. We ed edit one of their books and we create an agreement. Sometimes we are basically providing a service. Let's say a university doesn't have the means to publish an academic work and they pay us to get the work done. So Rialta's uh, ways of generating income are diverse and they do not directly depend on the model of selling copies of books, which of course we also do. So I completely agree with what uh, Pablo was saying. I mean, we're publishing books since we're not doing it because it's good business. We, what we are creating is a space of legitimation for authors beyond the uh, exclusive criteria of Cuba's government institutions. I can't think of an example, but I am sure it must have happened previously that Pablo or Waldo may have uh, been offered a book and uh, we ended up publishing it at Rialta. So there is diversity, there is an ecosystem, an author may prefer to publish here rather than there. And this uh, allows us to distance ourselves from these criteria of exclusion and these dynamics proper to Cuba's publishing world where sometimes you don't even need to have a government agent by your side censoring you. You already know that there are set limits and we are trying to work beyond those limits and it's important. And I think that the idea of the archive entails, it's an incredible effort. Something we do in our publishing house and other of our projects is to recover the historical memory and the intellectual history of uh, the country because it's been gagged and erased. And we have also created, uh, tried to create a space for discussion. This is a very in important role and we are uh, fulfill and it's independent projects that are getting that kind of work done. Maybe sometimes we do it wrong, we make mistakes, but I think that we are getting it done and this has really altered the panorama in the public sphere and the way that public discussion is held in Cuba. And it is partly the result of our of the work of publishers. I think that this issue about funding and profit that we keep discussing, it's actually a false dilemma. There's a thousand ways to to make a profit. At the end of the day, you have a bank account and money coming in and money coming out. What, what brings the money in? It's it's not so important. And I think that all of those who are here present today, we have been looking for alternatives to have uh, different ways of gaining an income. As for the relationship with authors, I think that beyond the individual relationship that a publisher has, with an author often i mean the four of us are authors ourselves 
I mean, we grew up in the context of the Latin American boom with writers like Vargas Llosa, García Márquez, Cortázar, and this created the image of the author, the literary author, as a successful person, somebody who becomes a millionaire by writing 100 years of solitude. Vargas Llosa, by age 42, had published three important novels and lives in Barcelona without having to work. So Spanish publishing houses, but through their marketing, created a mindset in, uh, in Latin America. I mean, already Vargas Llosa, in his memoir, recently published, he says that he went to Paris in the 1950s because he imagined that he would be a writer and be successful. He had this idea of uh, Bohemian Paris, the same with Bryce Echenique. Why? The marketing of Spanish language publisher created the image of authors as successful people. And failing to reach that is a failure to a writer. This is very different from the case in other contexts. I think about writers like James Joyce or Samuel Beckett or writers like Ezra Pound who ended up imprisoned for political for his political ideas in Italy. It's a strange uh, mindset in underdeveloped countries that were was a bit nurtured by Franco era Spain. The idea that even when Vargas Llosa publishes a terrible novel like The Bad Child, the Alfaguara will add a label saying that 200,000 labels uh, have been printed. So when our authors says, how many copies are you going to print? We say, well, 500. And the author will say, well, this is shit. Vargas Llosa, they print 200,000 copies. So they think that you are not worth anything as an author. So I think it's the responsibility is the Latin American boom and its perception as a novelist, as a socially successful people. You see Vargas Llosa, who's a candidate, ran for president, and Garcia Marquez, who was a close friend of Fidel Castro and goes lobster fishing. So authors crafted a fantasy about their trade but it's just marketing to conclude i see that there are two interesting topics basically we all know that the biggest challenge in the publishing world is sustainability and profit a small publishing house is a is a labor of love but it's also a company small company, a mid-sized company. This depends on the business creativity. But I would like to ask you to share with the audience to tell us about your plans. We're talking about inventing something. Right, you Cubans understand this euphemism. Yesterday we were talking about a Puerto Rican boy, we're talking about bregar, which is working hard, inventar, coming up with something. But I would like to ask you if you have a particular project, an idea that you have of a strategy that would allow you to be sustainable. Maybe you can find a way to have a small project that right now is funded through grants. I mean, this is how the free world works. The only places where it doesn't work this way is in places that are not free. Everywhere else, small projects might have a grant from the government or from, from the private sector. So this is valid to have this kind of funding. But have you conceived a way to break the cycle and create a sustainable economy? As we know, maybe book distribution or the selling of books is not a way, but I think that there maybe are other ways 
lado que le permite distribución de libros, etc. Eh, hay algunos modelos de negocio. There are different kinds of business models that could be useful. And I would like to ask you if you have explored or if you have a project, a possible way of creating a form of sustainability that does not, is not based on the selling of copies, because we know that unless you have a, enough financial muscle to be part of the big book market, it may happen that you produce a book in Mexico and you cannot distribute it in Spain. So it's not just about producing the book. You print 100,000 copies, you send it to Spain and they will say your ISBN is not Spanish. So the publishing world is more complex than readers and even writers often can perceive. So maybe if you could sh share if you have some ideas, if you haven't thought about it, that's fine. But I think that it's important for our audience to understand the many different issues that the publishing world. Well, in the case of Boque and Almenara, I would say that Boque is, in a sense, subsist under the shadow of Almenara. This means that the sustainability of Boque depends on Almenara. I mean, about the academic world and projects that end up becoming books, but then they have a funding from universities, etc., etc. So this is the model that I have with two different projects, one of which sustains the other. There are advantages to such a model. I think that the greatest advantage is that you can retain a certain degree of independence. The greatest disadvantage is that Boque depends on Almenara. So there is internal dependence. If Almenara were, were to cease to function, so would Boque. This is what determines to some extent, the business dynamic of these two projects. As far as projects or fantasies, for a long time, I was trying, trying to get OK books distributed in Latin America. And at some point, it seemed like it might happen and it hasn't happened yet. And I am uh, no longer expecting that. This also raises many questions. I don't know if the others have come across the same questions. It's the same kind of a question that I was asking regarding this idea of the natural Cuban reader. I don't know if the fact that Boque books were distributed in Latin America would entail a corresponding increase in sales. I wonder, I would love to think that the sales would be greater if we had greater distribution, but I am not certain. And I ask myself to what extent, since there is a crisis in reading, and, and writing. We were talking about authors and as Ladislao saying, the imagery about the author as an authority, this is all currently in crisis. And the crisis is much deeper than you would see if you see it in our local terms. We are small, Cuban independent publishers. I think that there are variables that we are not able to calculate right now. In the in our small world, the variables that we can calculate have to do with this uh, 
internal dependence between the two projects that allows for a degree of independence with regard to the external context. You're talking about distribution. Well, just only a month ago, I was approached by a, a distributor from Spain who was interested in distributing our books in Spain. I said, that's fine, I will send a catalog. And then they said, okay, you have ISBN numbers from the United States. This is a contradiction because ISBN is supposed to be an internationally accepted number. And then they said your ISBN must be Spanish or Latin American. So now I know that there is an interest, but knowing that I would have to create a new company to acquire ISBN numbers and publish the books twice over to be able to have the titles distributed in Spain's market, which is a wider market. So these are obstacles that you come across and you ask yourselves what they are about. Well, they are about national bureaucracies. In the case of Pablo and me, we purchase our ISBN numbers in the United States because uh, this is where our publishing houses are located. If Pablo wanted to distribute in Spain, he would come across the same obstacle. I would have to create a company in Spain, in Spain and pay taxes in both countries. This is not just uh, the problem for us who are Cuban. It's the kind of issue that comes up in the Spanish language uh, publishing world and uh, protectionist economics and other such matters. We have tried out many different ways of uh, obtaining funds. We have even considered pretty crazy ideas. We test different things and some work and some don't. But we do have the will to stay afloat. At some point, you jump into the ocean and you need to stay afloat, especially because now uh, there are many families who depend on Rialta as an organization. I think that, moreover, our work is the work that Rialta does and all of the other publishers who are here. We do very valuable work. So we have considered maybe creating a subscription system, not strictly connected to the publishing house. We are considering selling subscriptions and then subscribers, they would get the books, but with the, some kind of personal touch. We have also assessed marketing strategies, niche marketing for the for educational contexts. So we are trying out these strategies and I can tell you later how, how well they work, but we are constantly discussing ideas and proposals. You'd think this is impossible. One day a university approached us and they said, listen, we have a professor who has published with you, how much would you charge to advertise a course that's being taught by this professor in your website for so many days? So we responded, uh, we considered, well, they are even thinking about using our website as an advertising platform. So this is interesting. It's I wouldn't say it's a model to follow yet, but we, we can check it out. Rialta functions as a kind of a channel and we also help each other out. We organize some events. We have a kind of news platform and it all it, it is all interrelated. And this means that one of the branch of the work that we do may contribute to the survival of the others.
primer suscrito. Ya, sí. ya no, no, no. Suscripción. Definitivamente es una idea genial. Y creo que I think that no the subscription so, service so, is a great idea. Cuando piensas como, como empresa, I think that often when you begin to think uh, of yourself as a company, you start coming up with other things. I used to have a design company and at some point somebody requested something from us. A tobacco factory um, hired us to redesign their labels and through that we created a small area that was focused on that market. Then another client, we did some advertising for them, but they required for a certain form of distribution and we also started developing that kind of work and we were able to get some income. When you start to develop a business model, you come across opportunities for other forms of business that you choose to explore. So maybe if you say, I'm a publisher, I just want to publish books and I want to have intellectual conversations with smart authors. Maybe it turns out that you need to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty because there may be a parallel business. It could be printing, distribution, advertising. And this is what leads some businesses to succeed and others to fail. And sometimes they succeed thanks to the a work that is not as um, noble. And maybe it's difficult for us who are interested in publishing because we idealize the process as a whole. Okay, we will conclude because we sh we haven't heard from Pablo yet, and he also is a bit of a business thinker. So I would like to know if he has uh, some ideas, if he has any uh, extravagant strategies. Well, to be honest, right now, Casa Vacía only only works as long as uh, my pocket can fund it for personal reasons or for other kinds of reasons. To be brief, I would like to follow up on what Ladislao said, a Cuban uh, writer who lives in Barcelona. We just published the second edition of Reynaldo Arena's Dispersed Prose. So this writer says, I want to write a review, but there is a problem. Three of the most important newspapers in Spain, none of them will allow you to review a book that is not published in Spain. Well, look, you, you tell yourself, a book of yours, if it's reviewed in El País or El Mundo, this may have an impact. I don't know how, how much of an impact it might be, but right from the start, you have this obstacle. A book you publish cannot be reviewed in any of these uh, newspapers within the, the market in Spain, which is alongside the Mexican market. These are the two largest uh, markets for Spanish language publications. So this is an example of how difficult it is to compete. But OK, I, as I said before, right now, the possibility of Casa Vacía to grow is really depends on my own financial capacity. I would, I would put it like that. OK, some people in the audience have a few questions. And if you would be kind enough to answer them. Hello, thank you. We are a publishing group. We are called Samistat, and it's very interesting to hear your ex experiences. We are very grateful for the idea of an incubator. We liked, we liked that idea because we are also involved in trying to incubate book projects. And we have, for some time, we have been studying the publishing context, but also we are in investigating gender exclusion in publishing. 
in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th and 21st centuries, the exclusion of women from the role of authorship, but also in print, printing and in being editors. I would like to ask how you perceive, if you perceive that in your context there is exclusion, if it's an urgent issue, if you are mindful of it in your editorial policy, how do you understand the exclusion of women from the uh, publishing world? Uh, it's an excellent question. Of course, we we leave some things without discussion because we got into some technical issues, but how you compose your catalog is also an important issue. How you choose your authors and if these centuries old social prejudices uh, lead you to uh, certain forms of discrimination, in hypermedia, right now, more than half of the staff is women, and we created the figure of a gender editor, both for our journal. The journal is where it's most important because it's a daily publication, and we have a gender editor. This is a person who is being aware of uh, how uh, gender is being treated. And in the case of the publishing house, it's a diverse catalog. It depends more on the author than on the author's gender, how the book functions in the cosmos that is made up of our other titles. Our most recently published title is by a woman and the previous, it's, uh, well, it's sometimes men, sometimes women. In our case, the truth is that we do not have a quota policy. I would say that I think, in fact, that some of the best uh, books published by Boke are by women authors. So we have published books by uh, novelists and poets who are women, but we don't have a gender politics or a quota politics, and I don't think that they are necessary. The question is not simply about author quotas. It's about you as publishers. We are asking about women editors, women publishers who can make a decision about how to create this archive because gender is also a way of uh, creating a different kind of archive. So I was not asking about quotas. I would say that since any publishing house fulfills the role of an archive, but more so Cuban publishing houses, but this also means that it would be important for women editors to play a role in generating this uh, historical narrative. In the case of Rialta, it's a team of over 15 people. Today it's me here speaking, but I think that our it's the team that uh, has good ideas and ideas that fail. It's a very diverse team, and often we disagree. And the team is also plural. Our editorial coordinator is a woman. Our graphic designer is a woman. Now, from an institutional point of view, we don't have policies or norms. But this connects with something we have said before. We are all working. Uh, under a lot of uncertainty in terms of uh, work. We do have a salary, but we don't have any social benefits. We don't have any 
social welfare, and if something happens, we are we would be all out of work. Uh, and in Rialta, it's the same for both men and women. So we are gradually building it up. At first, we were just working out of our own pocket. We would make 600 pesos in the $600 for a grant to study in Mexico. And we felt that we were rich. And we put it together in that way. So we still have a long way to go. And I think that our most important work is yet to come. And uh, in order to support the structure that we have constructed and reinforced it, it's uh, the first thing we have to do is to is ensure that we can uh, offer some guarantees as an organization. I was working at a university for five years, for example, and at some point, you tell yourself either I go crazy or, or I have to give up one of these two jobs. But I was I had access to many other things through the university, for example, health insurance and working in Rialta, I have access to none of that. So we are assembling all of this gradually. These are projects that started in 2016 and I think that it's it's a short time. We've only been at it for five years. Even from the point of view of a business, the first five years are only the first stage of a project. Many companies cannot expect to make a profit in the first five years because you're setting the foundations. But I think that this question about gender, the publishing world, needs to confront these questions. Most successful publishing houses are run by men. And that is the world we live in. Gradually, different kinds of projects are emerging, but of course you have, a, it's also in Caribbean cultures, often men feel entitled to uh, take on some ventures. And there is a machismo. Uh, men feel more entitled. And our societies have grown gradually modified this. But the truth is that in this large ecosystem of small independent publishers, I would say maybe 20% is run by women. I don't have a number, but I would say that it's a real challenge. Right, but you're talking about books published, but not by publishing houses. Maybe two or three publishing houses in Miami are run by women. Let's say if you have 30 or 40 independent publishers and four or five are run by women, it's a very small proportion. And I think that this is connected to these societies, not just in Cuba, but also in the countries where these publishers are located. For example, in these countries, uh, the idea of taking on an entrepreneurial business project is still functions differently for women than it does for men. There is a social prejudice that prevents, makes it harder for women to take on the leadership role of an editor. So these are really complex social issues that you are bringing to the table. You have you have said that you're writing for a future reader, but you are also working against a present day repressor. So I wanted to ask how you relate to repression from the Cuban regime. Maybe sometimes it confronts you directly, maybe sometimes it, con it uh, represses you online. Has this influenced your catalog or your work? Many of you don't just publish a journal or a book series. Many of you are almost... <laughs> Y 
ese, ese fue el represor presente. So, ahí está la respuesta. Ahí está la... That's the end. That was the Cuban government. It's the present day repressing agent. Mira, 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 ahora. No vamos a mencionar. Bueno, pero como decía, son más que un editorial. Well, as I was saying, you are not just publishing houses. You're almost cultural centers. You don't just publish a journal daily or weekly to convey news. You also organize events like this, where you have a conversation between different people. But if you could discuss a little bit how, how you have dealt with persecution and what, what have been the consequences. Well, Boque, when it comes to Boque, we have never dealt with uh, repression. Of course, some of our authors who live in Cuba have run into trouble for what they write, not because they publish for Boque. I think that I think authors are more directly affected in the sense of what they write or fail to write. The impact is more on authors than on publishers because publishers, there might be collateral damage ultimately, but the person who's on the front lines is the author. And this is, of course, reflected in what they write or fail to write. In, in my case as well, our head editor lives in Cuba, and especially when at some point there was a moment when there was a, we received some attacks by email or on social media. But my current space as an editor, where I am now located, I am not directly impacted by repression. Sometimes I, 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 am, I have an, I am, there is an indirect impact, but yeah, repression impacts us in many ways. In very personal terms, I don't speak, I speak only about my personal, I would say repression modulates how you think. I live in Querétaro, Mexico, and I know that state security, Cuban state security is not going to knock on my door, but it does impact me because I cannot send a box of books to Cuba. The new legislation, but even before, allows them to criminalize the work of an entire staff, people who are professionals and have a family. We have a very brave people have uh, stopped collaborating with us since uh, they discussed us in the news, in the TV news in Cuba. They said, you know, I love you, but I'm not going to get into trouble. Someone was in home in prison. Yes, so there is direct repression, uh, detentions, imprisonment, beatings. They don't, it's not that they put you two days in prison, you are constantly being surveilled, and this impacts your family. 
because in Cuba, specialists are extremely apolitical. To discuss politics is a criminal. So you're told, don't talk about politics, live your life as if politics didn't impact every aspect of your life. So families also start to function in a way that, you know, there's a real impact. So in practical terms, you can't send books. When we started Rialta in 2015, 2016, late 2016, we even organized a couple of presentations in Cuba. Nothing happened. But at some point, something does happen. At some point, politics and especially repression impacts you. When there is a review about your work in Granma or on TV, then the rules of the game change. It's not that they are criticizing you. They will call you a mercenary or a terrorist and they will publish your photograph. Of course, uh, Cuban society has changed. I was watching the news program where they put my picture and I felt nervous. But an hour later, I had received 20 message, 20 text messages congratulating me. Uh, so it was appreciated. But sure, of course, repression modulates what you do as a person and your day-to-day -day work, and it also alters your standpoint, and it places you in uh, dynamics of constant tension. So we, we have decided that we are not going to fall into the trap of ideological uh, the ideological confrontation between the Cuban government and some of its opponents. We don't want to be part of upholding an ideological discussion because Cuban society is right now too ideological and not political enough. So we don't want to fall into these rhetorical traps. Maybe this sounds pretentious, but I think that what is important is for us to maintain aesthetics as a place of refuge, as a last refuge, and this has many implications. It also has to do with how we relate to the real and how we deal with it. I agree. Uh, our, for us, it's been very similar to Rialta. The Cuban media the Cuban uh, media determine public opinion and shape public debate. And when they single us out, when they label us a certain way, this impacts people who authors or other people who might be interested in working with us and they prefer not to do so because because of fear and this is human and we live with that. This in addition to practical limitations such as the fact that we cannot distribute our printed journal, we cannot sell the books. Or even the possibility of presenting the books to sharing with the possible readers what we are publishing because it is all mediated by an ideological confrontation and the Cuban government excels at ideological confrontation and we are constantly trying to step outside of that tone. We claim that this cannot be the way that we discuss. So, in spite of our attempts, I remember that in 2017, my mom was in panic because uh, there was a news item 
that said that we were created by the CIA. My mom, who is 70 or so years old, was in panic because uh, her son was being accused of being a CIA agent. Just because someone thought that the closest thing to a publishing house was a CIA collaborator. Something else, we have seen that when the Cuban regime faces cultural competition, when they can't handle the competition, they absorb its strategies, they copy them, and they try to compete to them, although they could in no way match what the independents do. But in your case, have you been able to determine if your publications have had a certain degree of influence within maybe, I don't know, a cultural strategy inside Cuba? We've seen this in film and the visual arts, but I'm wondering if it's the same in the field of publications. Well, I'm not talking about Rialta or any particular project, but about the ecosystem as such. Maybe that's uh, the point of your question. I think that independent journalism, independent publications, have started to determine the news agenda. So uh, topics that were not discussed before are discussed now. So if you go into Cuba Debate, you could do a word count and you would see that the word dictatorship has come up on the platform 10 times in the last week, whereas this work was this word could not be used before. So it's a very ideological version but to a certain degree, some issues are now being discussed and are now part of the news uh, cycles. And this is through the pressure of independent media. And I think in the last two or three years, uh, civil society has matured greatly and this has been very important. But uh, you say, Look now, Rialta is a cultural platform and randomly, most of our staff and friends were part of the 27N events and these events were so important in Cuba. But we were the ones who had people there reporting. Somebody's phone would run out of battery and then someone else would pick it up again. And then they said that we were the official uh, news media of the protest and that we were prepared, but this was not the case at all. This was spontaneous. But these events uh, were known through the work of the press. It's also a kind of uh, citizen's journalism and it's been very healthy, but it's also a, a journalism that is become increasingly professional. Now we have properly speaking news media who have been working for about five years and it's completely different. I think that this is maybe an example. When we, when we published a certain book, two years later, I received an audio file, anonymous, a doctor was being visited by state security and the physician says, who are you? Haven't you read the book, El Compañero Que Te Atiende? That's me. So the, the book had been read and made an impact 
even in the state security forces. So uh, to explain who he was, this uh, state agent was describing himself as the character in the book. All of us Cuban journalists and publishers, we first worked in Cuban institutions and we worked at Havana University and in other institutes. So we were part of the institution. So when you leave and you start another project, to some extent you are maybe not competing, but you are assessing that discourse. And you gradually obtain higher degrees of freedom. The fence moves little by little. It's not going to disappear. All of a sudden you need to push it and push it but the situation of Cuban culture nowadays within the island, publications have disappeared because sometimes they don't even have uh, money to print. Many people are abroad and those who are in the island are also publishing through independent media. So the, the landscape of a uh, the public discussion has significantly changed, and I think that uh, publishers and media have played a really important role. Waldo, would you add something? I think I would just sum up what the others have said. I think that the biggest reach that could be obtained by independent publishers or sources of uh, information is the very fact that they exist, the fact that there are other publishers completely alters the system. A few years ago, a Cuban author had three choices, three publishers that they can uh, to convey their work, but now they have many more. The mere fact uh, has an, a broad impact because it restructures a system based on influence, prestige, and authority. It has to do with the authority of an author, but also of a publishing house, whether you are acknowledged or not as an author. So I think that the sole existence of these independent spaces has a great impact. And the fact that they exist is uh, what is most important rather than any individual publication or beyond specific cases, I think that the dynamics of the system have been completely altered. And that's the interesting point, I would say. Yes, because you alter the system of legitimation in the literary, literary world. Maybe at first some independent publishers did not enjoy the same prestige as some of the national publishers in Cuba. This has changed considerably. So, about 10 years ago, there was the Encuentro de la Cultura Cubana. Access to that was a bit clandestine. Whereas nowadays, I'm sure that some of the independent outlets have more readers than some of the official publications. I mean, Pablo himself, Pablo alone publishes more books than Ediciones Union. So this is no longer a clandestine ecosystem. It's something else. Do you want to add something, Pablo?
We couldn't hear Pablo. Well, I want to thank you for your generous participation. I think that you have established a very high level debate. I hope that we will be able to keep up the intellectual weight of this debate in following conversations. We have discussed practical issues, but we have also discussed concepts and we have had a very honest conversation. So I hope uh, people who are watching online or who may be viewing it in the future will learn a lot from it and this will allow us to think the country and the publishing world as carlos was saying you said something very beautiful the idea that aesthetics is uh, the space of uh, utmost freedom and think that we have ex expressed this beautifully through the work that you put into your projects and how you have created a new dynamics for the cuban publishing world so i want to thank you personally I will say goodbye now and thank you again for your presence.